Welcome to the Exposing Pseudo-Astronomy podcast for another example of astronomy misconceptions, half-truths, and conspiracies. My name is Stuart Robbins, and this is episode four, a bonus episode for the month of September. I'm putting it out on September 10th and 11th, which, besides a fairly important anniversary in the United States, is also a timely date for the purpose of this particular episode. The topic that I'm going to give a short discussion on is that of Comet Elenin. Now, before I go into it, I want to briefly talk about bonus episodes such as this being the first one. Now, I've decided that I'm occasionally going to put out bonus episodes, which will happen at odd intervals, will be a varying length, and will only include the main segment, the main topic. With that said, let's move on to Elenin. Now, the basic idea that I want to address is that common Elenin is supposedly some portender of doom and gloom, and maybe a herald of 2012 over the Hopi Blue Star prophecy or something else. The basic background information is that this object is a comet. You may hear otherwise by conspiracy people, in fact, you will later in this podcast, but it's a comet. It was discovered by a Russian mathematician and amateur astronomer Leonid Elenin, hence why it's called Comet Elenin. It's an unremarkable object, estimated to be about 3 to 4 kilometers and across, and it's currently in the inner solar system near its closest approach to the Sun. The closest it's going to get to Earth is about the distance of Venus, 22 million miles or 35 million kilometers. Pretty far away, that's it. And it may not even get that close because it appears to be breaking up as of early September and may not survive its closest approach to the Sun. There's really nothing much else to say about it, as this kind of object has been seen many times in the past several years, indeed the last hundred years or so, but for some odd reason that I have yet to understand, people have been regressing in mentality by about 5,000 years. That said, I'm going to go into two sets of claims. What really uh, Leonard Elnin stands for is... Um, uh, a meteor shower that comes out of the constellation of Leo, okay? Leonid is actually Leo with a, with a meteor shower. And then Elenin is, actually stands for extinction level event. Nibiru is near. That particular clip comes from the Seven Theory Ministries, and I'll be posting links to all of these YouTube clips on the show notes on the website. Now, it's an interesting set of claims. I don't know Leonid Elenin, so I can't honestly vouch for him being a real person. However, I've seen pictures of the man purportedly to be him, or that are purported to be him. He looks real enough, but seriously, if you don't believe that the guy is even real, then you've stepped into a level of conspiracy from which I cannot pull you out. I suggest that you turn this off now because you may cause harm to your aluminum foil hat. Now, for those of you who are still interested and who are still listening, I'll get into Nibiru in a later podcast on the whole Planet X in 2012 phenomenon, but suffice to say for now, Nibiru is the name of a hypothetical 12th planet proposed by the now-dead Zachariah Sitchin, who created his own translations of Sumerian tablets in order to come up with this. The idea has been heavily adopted by the 2012 crowd, which is why I'll be talking about it more extensively in a future episode. Now, this next set of clips that I'm going to go through in this grouping of claims of random stuff is from the RT America YouTube channel. And joining us now for more is Brooks Agnew, host of X Squared Radio. Brooks is also the author of this book, Remembering the Future, the Physics and Soul of Time Travel. Some might accuse me of poisoning the well by interjecting here, but I really should note that Brooks Agnew is also a person who has, for years, stated that the Earth is hollow, and if only he has a few more hundred thousand dollars, he could lead that North Pole expedition he's been trying to get together for at least the last five years in order to prove that it's the entrance to the hollow Earth, which can only be reached when you are spiritually attuned. More on that in a future episode. Anyway... What do you think are some of the most viable, maybe one or two of the most viable theories out there in terms of what we should be aware of regarding this comment? Well, what we should be aware of is that the, the projections by JPL of its actual path uh, are, are highly estimated. There are a lot of forces working on this comet as it travels through our solar system from a very odd angle, and not all of them have been calculated. So we're kind of making a guess as to where this thing is going to end up. 
This may have been true when comet Elenine was first discovered, but in actuality you only need three observations in order to calculate an orbit. Since it was first discovered, this comet has been observed literally tens if not hundreds of thousands of times, and we know its orbit pretty darn well, at least around now and for the next several months. Claiming that we don't know where it's going to end up is just wrong. In another segment, Agnew makes claims that relate more to the whole 2012 mythos, something that I'll be addressing later in future episodes, several future episodes, so I'm not really going to get into that much here. Now, in another YouTube video, we have this. This video is being made to help people wake up to what is coming later this summer in the Elenin Comet slash Dwarf Star. Now, I don't think I really need to go into the whole conspiracy mindset here, but I did think it only fair to introduce this next series of clips with this person's motivation to help us. With that in mind, this sets us up for a longer clip, and this is probably the longest clip I'll be including. It's one that addresses a lot of what people are claiming. In this, you're going to hear about earthquakes and brown dwarfs and black holes in a totally unracist way. Minsure Amar Basich came out with this paper on April 11th called Astronomical Alignments as the Cause of Magnitude 6 Plus Seismicity. In his paper, he included the Elenin Comet because of the pattern of big quakes, which is impossible for an icy mass. By definition, a comet is supposed to be 85% ice. Anything that is this large with this mass must be visible. And the astronomers that are in my groups are having very much difficulty in seeing this thing. So there's a problem with the data according to what we're supposed to see. One problem is that on an alignment on February 27, 2010 in Chile, 8.8 .8 quake, the Earth aquifer shifted, the Earth axis shifted three inches. The next year, Japan quake on March 11th here we have another alignment and look what look what happens earth axis shifted four inches earth aquifers in Florida and Texas shifted which is pointing to a large object something of great mass we're talking about something of great mass bigger than Jupiter but for some reason can't be seen as stated in the radio show there's a very small classification of objects that can be inbound causing this seismicity that's invisible. One of them is a dwarf star, another is a black star or a black hole. That's a very short list. I tried to warn you that there was a lot of stuff in there, and there is, so let's try to deconstruct it. Now, the basic claim is that Elenin was causing, or is causing, or has caused, or will cause earthquakes. Therefore, it must be massive. But it's also faint, so it must also be a small object. Therefore, it's a dead star coming through. When that dead star makes certain alignments, bad stuff is going to happen. First, the earthquakes. The person mentioned, which I'm going to stumble over the name just as poorly, uh, Mensur Omar Basic, you know, something like that, is such a crank that Rational Wiki has its own page about him, and I'm going to link to that in the show notes. Basically, he does what a lot of other earthquake, quote-unquote, predictors will do, which is to look for anything astronomical that was going on when there was an earthquake, and then say that that was the cause. He was also actually fairly unknown until he started to write about common Elenin causing earthquakes, which rocketed him up in the pseudoscience stardom list. With that said, his ideas lack any credibility whatsoever. Alignments such as those suggested and those that I'll talk about later on, can't really do anything that he thinks that they did. And therefore, it's not evidence that Elenin is incredibly massive, and therefore, there's no evidence that it is a dark star. If it were a star-sized massive object, then it would perturb the orbits of all of the planets and the asteroids to the point that it would be easy even for an amateur astronomer to take notice. But that has not been the case. Much ado has been made about supposed alignments on special days with Elenin. Now, I'm going to address a few of those in the next set of claims, the scenario proposed by Richard C. 
Hoagland. Now, I'm going to do a show, possibly multiple shows, in the future about Richard Hoagland, but for now, for those of you who don't know, Hoagland basically made his name with the whole Face on Mars pareidolia, and it's his habit to take low-resolution images, blow them up to astronomical sizes, and find conspiracies in the noise and pixelation. He has also invented a whole hyperdimensional physics that, as I said, I'll get into in a future show. What you need to know about this hyperdimensional physics is that it's really big on numerology, and that 19.5 is a very important number in his hyperdimensional framework. Now, one more thing about Richard Hoagland is that he talks a lot. He will interrupt you, he won't let you interrupt him, and he'll even speak through commercial breaks. Hence, the clip that I wanted to play for you is about 10 minutes, which is actually fairly short for him. Instead, I'm going to play small parts of it and go through his claims individually as they come. I can actually calculate the probability that this whole thing is just by chance. And what you do with probabilities, you take the probability of any individual coincidence, and then you multiply it by the probability of the next coincidence. Okay, so we have the basis for what Hoagland is going to say that the basic premise for this being a non-random event, and therefore a spaceship, has to do with the probabilities of unlikely events. Let's listen. How do I decide what the probability of of uh, Leonid Elenine discovering Comet Elenine at 19.5 magnitude would be by simple chance? Well, the brightest comet ever observed by, by astronomy was Ikea Secchi in 65. That was 17th magnitude, minus 17. The dimmest comet ever observed is Halley with Hubble in 2003 as it's moving way out toward the outer part of its orbit now after passing close to us in 1986. That's at plus 28.2 magnitude. So the total range is 45.2 magnitudes. So the chance odds of discovering a comet at magnitude 19.5, that's plus 19.5, is 1 in (laughs) 45.2. Okay. There are a few things here that, right off the bat, are simply factually wrong. But first, a quick explanation of the magnitude scale. The magnitude scale is that lower numbers are brighter and bigger numbers are fainter. The sun is around negative 26 magnitude, as seen from Earth, while Pluto is around plus 13. It's also a logarithmic scale, where every change of 2.5 in magnitude is a change of a factor of 10 in brightness. So a magnitude 0 object is 10,000 times brighter than a magnitude plus 10. Now on to the wrongness. Comet Ikea Seki, and I apologize to the 0.1% of my listeners who are from Japan, it reached its brightest point at magnitude negative 10, not negative 17. But besides this, comets are not discovered at their brightest. They're discovered usually when they're in the positive teens of magnitude, like around the brightness of Pluto or some darker asteroids. This is the same case with Comet Ikea Seki, which was discovered when it was a faint object on September 18, 1965. This is really a fairly basic fact in astronomy, and I'm surprised, I'm literally surprised that Richard is making such a wrong statement. I mean, he makes so many other wrong statements that it really wouldn't have been much to have this one be correct, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, it's true that finding a comet at plus 19.5 magnitude is fairly impressive because that's a pretty darn faint object. Now, it's not unprecedented, and it's also not as though Elenin was using a backyard telescope. He was looking at images from a world-class observatory. In order to figure out the odds of discovering the comet at such a magnitude, you would need to look at a histogram of at what magnitudes other comets were discovered. I'm not going to go into that much effort for this, but it's likely somewhere like a 1 in 5 chance maybe 1 in 10 if we want to be generous to Richard, but it's really not a 1 in 45.2 chance. That's just...